Hello, beautiful people, or should I say, meow. Uh, everything's going there. Yes, it is. This is different. This is not morning. I normally do this first thing in the morning where I'm waking up to coffees. I don't have my usual coffee mug, so I have my bottle of water. But doing it at this time is really good because my magic little porthole to uh, England, there was somebody sniffing around outside, and I reckon he should just ring the door and see who's that. Who's out there? That is... Mr. Tom Quayle. Hey, Tom. Hey, dude. How you doing? I am doing great. What part of England are you Excellent. in, mate? I'm in Leeds, which is in the north of England. Um, yeah, it's about an hour away from Liverpool. Probably heard of Liverpool, an hour away from Manchester. I have, yes. Sort of, yep. You know, in that northern area. So it's surprisingly warm here right now, considering we're getting into autumn. It's actually quite nice. So uh, global warming is doing its thing. Ah. But yeah, it's great. Nice. I'm just coming out of winter here, and uh, it's funny. Normally, I do these in my pajamas in the morning, but I went and had a shower and put in my pajamas for a PM one, so um, I'm feeling nice and comfortable. Nice and chilled. It's Very all good. about the comfort. Yeah, As well, I said, mate, it's all... Yeah, exactly. It's, um, yeah. like I said, mate, it's all about the, the comfort and just taking it as it goes. We do have a slight delay, a little bit of a lag, folks, if you to find us talking over each other. I'm going to try and give way when possible so that I don't do that too often. But Tom, I am going to ask you the question I ask everybody at the start, and that is, what started the love affair with the electric guitar for you? Yeah, good question. My my dad on both my parents are really great musicians. And although my dad was a veterinary surgeon by trade, that's what he did for a living, he was an amazing, or still is an amazing guitarist. And he's a a finger style guitar player. Like anybody who follows me will have heard this story because it's something I really like to tell people because I, I like to tell people, you know, my original influence was my dad, which I think is really cool. That's very cool. He played um, a lot of Tommy Emmanuel stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Tommy Emmanuel, Doyle Dykes, Leo Kotke, um, a lot of that very technical finger style guitar. And he used to just sit and transcribe it by ear. He didn't write it down or anything, although eventually he did start doing that when the internet came around. He was one of the first guys on the internet to start transcribing Tommy Emmanuel's stuff cool. uh, and sharing the transcriptions online uh, in the early days of, of that, which was quite cool. But he, he was the first inspiration. So when I was a kid, I used to go and sit in folk clubs, of all things, with my parents because they ran the local folk scene. And to be honest, I at the time, I hated the music because I just wasn't into that whole thing. But I loved the experience of watching my dad and various other people play the guitar. And I must have shown an interest because one day my dad came home with a copy of Guitar Techniques magazine for me to check out. Yep. And a, you know, I, I started, we had guitars in the house and my dad had, my dad had like a, he didn't really play electric, but he had a Gibson SG and of all things, a flying V, like some dodgy flying V copy. And I thought this thing was incredible. So basically, I got into it that way and started playing power chords, but very, very quickly got into, um, I was into a band called The Wild Hearts first, so a lot of kind of that punk kind of basic power chord stuff. And that, in the classic way it does for so many guitar players, transitioned into Metallica, Iron Maiden, uh, a lot of that stuff. Um, and then from there into all the shredders, and I was absolutely and thoroughly hooked. And I was the cliched guy who was doing six, seven, eight hours of playing. I wouldn't say it was practice. I was playing for six, seven, eight hours a, a day, you know, just trying to learn Steve Vai songs, Joe Satriani songs, yep. Dream Theater songs, Metallica songs, and all the solos and stuff. So yeah, that was my entry point into that whole thing. Very cool. And how old were you when you first started playing? I was 15. So a little bit older than, I mean, it's a, a general, you know, it's a, a standard starting point, but, you know, I have friends who played a lot earlier than that, but I was a little bit late to the party. Um, but yeah, it, it was just an interest that just kicked off. I can't remember why. I, I think it was just my dad decided one day, I'd obviously shown an interest in holding the guitar and stuff and was interested in what he was doing. So he thought, well, maybe a good way of getting him into it is to buy a magazine for him and just let him check out in his own time. Because I believe he tried to teach me some stuff. And it's that classic thing of you cannot sit down with your dad and learn. You know, you can learn stuff, but trying to learn the guitar. And he played a completely different style to what I was interested in. So it just it didn't work. So I think he thought, okay, we'll give him the magazine and see how he gets on. And I remember very clearly this magazine had 
uh, Metallica, Steve Vai, and um, it had Guthrie Govan playing. Um, the, the next one he got me had Guthrie Govan playing a cover of Under a Glass Moon in it by Dream Theater. Wow. And it was like, okay, this stuff is just, you know, I need to have all this stuff in my life. So it was kind of kind of a crazy entry point, but that's what it was. And what, what year was that? Like what, what time period are we talking? Are we talking late 80s, early 90s? So that was 95. 2000? 95. Okay, yeah. Cool, cool. Yeah, so, so mid-90s, yeah. Yeah. Mm. What, what was your first guitar? My, fir- my very first guitar was a really dodgy Strat copy called a Marlin Slammer, which was like a lime yellow, horrible looking thing. So we stripped all the wood off it. And actually, it was a decent guitar because it was a solid body guitar, like a lot of guitars at the time. I remember Yamaha making a big deal about the Yamaha Pacifica because a lot of the dodgy strats you could buy at the time were plywood. Yep. So you'd strip them off and you'd have all this terrible plywood uh, you know, bodies that had no resonance at all, even for a cheap guitar. But this thing was actually all right. It was a, a solid body guitar and it had decent hardware on. So I played that for a couple of months and then... You know, literally a couple of months down the line, I had an RG four. Was it four seventy? I think it was an Ibanez RG four seventy in black with black hardware. And that thing, man, that got battered to death. I played that thing to within an inch of its life, and I wish I still had it. You know, everybody wishes they still had their first good guitar, but I got rid of it years and years and years ago. But I mm. loved that thing so much; absolutely loved it. Wow, I still have my first. Um... A strat copy and that's a, that was a plywood guitar as well uh it's in pieces just over there i, I do want to do a little project uh-huh. one day and restore that and put together some, some nice hardware for it but i'm not convinced that i could make a plywood body sound good but can only try I, I had a i took the neck of mine um years later when we still had this guitar and i was having i had a couple of years of lessons uh in my entire life basically apart from going to jazz college and this guy I was having lessons with introduced me. He had a guitar with a scalloped neck. And I attempted to scallop the neck of this Marlin Slammer and absolutely destroyed it. Absolutely killed the thing. So I don't know. I don't that that probably exists in like a, a tip somewhere, just completely destroyed at this point. But uh, you know, that at least it was my entry point. So uh, you know, uh, I did love that thing a little bit, but not quite as much as the Ibanez. Yeah, I did a similar thing. I um uh, the Steve Vai Gem 77s uh, were out and they had the, the upper four frets scalloped out. So I uh, I did yeah, that on yeah. mine and I've done that on a couple of guitars since. And uh, <laughs> oh, there was a, a beauty one time I was doing it. I was talking to somebody and I had a bit of sandpaper wrapped around a pen and I was scall- scalloping away and I, I looked away to talk to somebody. And then as when I looked back, I just went, ah! I couldn't believe how deep I'd done it. So the whole butchering of it, yes, got to pay attention. That's that's what mine was like. You you could have t- the, the way I did it. It wasn't a particularly thick neck anyway. You could have literally tapped the headstock and it would have snapped in half. I did <laughs> such a bad job of it. And I remember going in because I didn't know you were supposed. I mean, it's obvious when you think about it. But I didn't mask off any of the frets or anything, so I was sort of ch- you know filing away and making a real mess of the frets and stuff. But I had no idea what I was doing. I just knew I wanted a scalloped guitar, and I didn't even know why I wanted one. I just thought it was a cool thing to do, and this was a, a really cheap guitar. Well, that was going to be my next question, was what inspired you to, to, to scallop it? Um, I know for me it was the Steve Vai, just of the upper frets, but you can't remember why? Yeah, I, I do remember what, actually, thinking about it now. I had, my, my teacher at the time had a guitar that he scalloped, and there were a lot of reasons why... Well, how old was I? I was about 16, 17 at the time when I was having lessons with this guy, and he was prepping me up for going and doing a jazz degree. So I was learning a lot of theory. And as far as I was concerned, I was hero worshipping this guy because he sounded at the time the way I wanted to sound. He's actually the reason I tune in all fourths as well. Cool. Um, because I was very influenced by this guy at the time. He was the first really great guitar player I'd seen in front of me, you know, close up playing the way I wanted to play. And he, he had a lot of knowledge as well. So I was, I was very kind of um, impressed by this guy. I was kind of, you know, hero worshiping, worshiping, you know, a little bit. And he had a guitar with scallop fret. So I thought, right, well, I'll try this. And of course, being a stupid 16, 17 year old, I didn't ask for his help. I didn't ask for advice. I just took a, a file and started going at this thing. 
and made an absolute pig's ear of it, you know, just a nightmare. But um, yeah, I, I definitely don't need a scalloped guitar at this point. I'm perfectly happy with a normal fretboard. Man, I think about that first guitar of mine, and I say the body's over there, and some of the, the things that I did, and I, I was like 14, 15. Uh, I decided I, I needed a Floyd Rose on there because I'd seen these these, trem these tremolos on guitars. And I, somebody gave me a really, really cheap guitar with a the, the nastiest Floyd Rose, Rose style tremor you could ever think of. And um, man, digging out, I didn't even have the tools for it. I, I remember digging out the cavity to put a humbucker in it and using a screwdriver and bashing that to get out the wood. Wow. And then there wasn't enough room uh, to hold the posts for the Floyd Rose in and it ended up pulling through. So we used auto bog to try and hold the posts in. And man, <laughs> wow. the, the, the things Crazy. I did to that first guitar, but you got to learn somehow, huh? <laughs> but that's that's why those first guitars are useful because after you get a good guitar you can just butcher them and do whatever you want to them to try and they're like experimental instruments and you always see uh you know people with those first guitars they're covered in stickers they look horrific but there's always a special place in your heart no matter what you've done to them for those first guitars i always remember that disgusting color of that marlin slammer but there's something about it that i just really really love yeah, you know, it, it just it's a good memory for me because it's that first guitar. So yeah, you know we've all got them. Absolutely, absolutely. Now you you mentioned uh, about going to jazz college earlier. Um, how old were you when you you decided to go and study? So I started my jazz degree in 1999. So I was 19. I'd been playing for four years, probably probably four and a half years at this point, um, and. I, again, before doing that, I was really into the shredders and, you know, really into, uh, you know, technique, you know, like a lot of guitar players, especially of my generation and the pre previous generation, we were all really obsessed with technique. And I remember sort of playing the guitar, I'd learned my three note per string scales and stuff and wasn't really that satisfied because I didn't feel like I knew anything about music. And this guitar teacher that I had, um, a guy from Leeds as well, a guy called Graham Young, he played me some Scott Henderson, who I know you've also had on your yep. podcast. Yep. And it was Scott Henderson playing with Jean-Luc Ponty. I can't remember what the album's called um, because there's a couple of Jean-Luc Ponty albums with some incredible guitar playing on. I think Alan Holdsworth played a um, some stuff with him as well. But he played me this track, and I just remember having my mind completely blown. So when you play guitar, I mean, you'll know this, there's certain, you can remember very visceral moments where your life just took a different trajectory musically, where you listen to a particular player or a particular album that someone showed you, and your world just changes. So for me, there were two albums that did that in terms of moving into that jazz territory that really appealed from a, from a kind of technique perspective still, but this harmony that I'd never heard before just totally moved me in a different direction. And, and Scott Henderson was one of those guys with whatever that, I cannot remember, unfortunately, what the album's called, the Jean-Luc Ponty album. I'll figure it out. And the other one was Heavy Machinery, the Alan Holdsworth album with Jens Johansson, uh, which I don't know if you know that album, but it's like no. a groove-based album where Jens is, is playing basically um, these crazy grooves and he's playing all the, the, the kind of bass line as well on the keys. And Alan's just, just shredding away, just playing crazy, crazy stuff. And I'd never heard anything like this before. I mean, everybody obviously says that when they hear Alan Holdsworth. It's like you talk to any guitar player and they talk about Alan Holdsworth and they go, I'd never heard anything like that before. It was incredible. But harmonically, that was the thing for me because obviously the technique I was sort of f familiar with and aware of. And I knew you could do stuff like that on the guitar, but I'd never heard harmony like this. And that was it for me. At the age of like 18, 17, 18, I became addicted to this harmony and I had to know what it was. And uh, I thought the way to do this is to go and study jazz and uh, ended up doing, it was three years of jazz that I did, three years at Leeds College of Music, which is like a conservatoire in the UK, or yep. conservatory in the UK. And it was great. I absolutely adored every second of it. Just having the excuse to do nothing for three years but play guitar, study music, you know, write a few essays here and there, get, yep. you know, drink far too much and all that kind of stuff that you do as a student. But, but basically just studying guitar for three years with nothing else to do was amazing. You know, it's great. I would recommend it to anybody. 
except for the crazy tuition fees that people have to pay these days. But other than that, you know, it was amazing. I think I paid a thousand pounds a year to do that, which is like a steal these days. It was amazing. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I actually went to go and study um, last year myself, just before COVID shut everything down. I enrolled at uh, a university to, to study a diploma in popular music, contemporary music, forget what it was, uh, with a view to go and teach there myself. Uh, but uh, I thought as an adult, I'd be able to study well. I, I was a bit of aloof in school, but I was diagnosed as having ADHD in recent years, and that really got the better of me. I, I lasted about two weeks, and I just thought, man, I just I just can't focus. I'll be sitting there listening to the in the lecture and going, oh, listen to the reverb time. It's like about 60 milliseconds down here, but it's about 200 up there, and fuck, I've totally forgotten. Just totally missed everything you just said there, and I can't rewind. So, you know, it's, it's, it's so weird these days because I used to be really good at that stuff. I could focus. I remember being so focused in my practice like you know whatever subject you took if it was fretboard knowledge time feel you know um chord voicings whatever you were doing i was able to sit down and focus for hours now there's no way this thing has ruined my ability to focus i mean i know everyone says this and it's a bit of a cliche but i just can't i can't concentrate on something for more than 10 minutes at a time it's probably got something to do with my age as well and the fact that I have a five-year-old daughter and I'm always absolutely knackered. But I just can't do it anymore. So I'll sit down with the best will in the world to do some proper hardcore practice where I'm going to better myself as a guitar player. And within 10 minutes, I'm either falling asleep or I'm thinking about, like you say, like I'm thinking about something else like, oh, what's happening on YouTube right now? Or thinking about, you know, gaming or something, you know, whatever. I find it really, really hard to concentrate. So I totally know where you're coming from on that one. Yeah, yeah. So you mentioned um, that you tune your guitar in fourths, and I've actually got a little video on my YouTube channel where um, I had a go of your guitar and then um, yeah. put up some diagrams to show how the whole three-note per string scale thing, when it slides over and, and the pattern just continues without having to um, shift up a fret when once you get to the B string. That was something I, I took away from it. What was it about the fourth tuning that, inspired you to take it up when so so in this time period sort of between the ages of 17 18 just before going to jazz college i was getting more interested in understanding the fretboard um and there's no two ways around it this is a very difficult and weird instrument to learn kind of physically where stuff is uh, a, a friend of mine a, an amazing guitar player called john wheatcroft describes the guitar as like six individual pianos you know each yeah, right. string is an individual piano because when you think about a piano you've got this linear progression of you know you've got an octave and let's say you take c major you've got an octave and you play a particular fingering in the next octave it's exactly the same fingering and it never changes no matter where you play it on the piano now individual scales have different fingerings and chords have different fingerings but once you've found that fingering in one octave it's the same everywhere there's no different positions that you would need different fingerings for. There's no different voicings that you need in terms of this voicing changes when you move it around the piano. Obviously your inversions will change change shape and, and, and voicings and so on and so forth, but the actual voicings specifically don't change as you move them around. Whereas of course on the guitar, you've got two problems, which is first of all, you can play the same note in multiple locations, literally the same note, which you cannot do on the piano or on the trumpet or on, I say you can't do it on the saxophone, you can, but it's not a standard way of, you know, you have these things called false fingerings, sure. but they're not proper fingerings. You can't play the same note in multiple positions. So that's the first problem on the guitar. And then the second problem is you've got this weird tuning that isn't equal across its, uh, you know, across the length of the guitar, because you have a perfect fourth between the E and the A, the same between the A and the D, the same between the D and the G, then a major third between the G and the B, and then back to a perfect fourth. So you've got this weird interval between the G and the B string that's not mapped anywhere else on the guitar. And of course, the reason for this is because the guitar is an accompaniment instrument by trade. It's only more recently that it's become a soloist single line monophonic based instrument. It's traditionally an accompaniment instrument. And if it's a solo 
instrument. It's generally a chordal based solo instrument in a classical sense. Um, and you need to be able to full sound. So we end up with these cowboy chords, as they call them, or bar chords. And you can't play these if you don't tune the guitar in this standard way of having this major third, because you end up having this weird scenario where you have to move the notes back on the top two strings. However, it makes it really difficult to learn the visual makeup, you know, physically, where is everything on the guitar? Where is harmony? Because if I play a C major seven chord here on the middle four strings, probably, probably recognize this shape, this gives us one shape if it's on the middle four strings. So people call this a string set. So we've got this middle four set up and it gives us this visual shape. But if I move these notes up an octave and play them on the top four strings, I end up with a different shape entirely. So the notes I'm playing and the intervallic sort of makeup of those notes, the distance between them is the same, but because of the tuning, the shape is different. If I play them on the bottom four strings, I get a different shape again. So in order to play the, the, just the chord, one chord, C major seven on the guitar, I already need three different shapes to play the same sound, okay? Now for 99.999% of guitar players, they just deal with this. It's like, that's something I have to do, so I'm gonna do it. But I didn't wanna deal with that. So what I've done is I've tuned the guitar in all fourths, so I've removed that major third interval, and it's now a, a perfect fourth as well. So I have a perfect fourth between every single string. So you now have this symmetry across the guitar where the interval between every single string is the same, very much exactly the same as a six string bass would be tuned. So bass players have done this forever. They, they're kind of, you shouldn't say this about bass players, but they're a little bit cleverer than guitar players in this regard, although they're not because they're not playing chords, you know, they're not playing these big chords, but they figured this out ages ago. Sure. So what this means is if I play a C major seven chord now, I get this shape. If I play it anywhere else on the guitar, it's now like a piano because the shape doesn't need to change. It's always the same. So it doesn't matter what octave I play it in. I've got loads of drive on, I apologize. The shape is the same. So instead of learning three things for one chord, I learn one thing for one chord. One voicing fits everywhere, okay? Now I'm not talking about inversions. So if I need to learn an inversion of a chord, say a first inversion, of the C major seven, that's that's a different shape because the intervallic structure of those notes is different. But once I've learned that shape, it's the same wherever I choose to play it. I don't have to learn a different shape for each string set, dependent on where I play it on the guitar. Whatever goes for chords goes for scales. So if I play a C major scale, that gives me a particular fingering that fingering never changes. It doesn't matter where I play it on the guitar, it's always the same. So again, I learn one thing and I can play it anywhere on the instrument, provided I use this, I start on that particular finger and you know the shape still works no matter where I play it. This just makes learning the fretboard exponentially easier. So it's cheating at guitar basically. It's making this, why make life difficult for yourself? That's that's awesome. How do you go? Do you do you use that tuning a hundred percent of the time, or do you ever revert to normal tuning? The only time, and these days less so because I do less teaching these days. Um, but when I, I I never ever play in standard tuning by choice ever because I can't because I learnt the fretboard in fourths. So I did not do, I mean, my learning in standard tuning was super basic. So if you said to me, play me a minor, I can play a minor pentatonic and I can play, if I really think about it, I can play scales and some chords in standard tuning. And obviously I know my basic open string chords because they were some of the first things I learned. But if you asked me to improvise in standard tuning, especially over some chord changes, I would, I, there's no way, absolutely no way I could do it. So realistically, the only time I ever play in standard tuning is if I'm doing something that requires it. So like one particular scenario I can remember is I did a DVD back in the day when people were buying DVDs for Lick Library, where I was teaching, I think, seven Steely Dan tunes. 
So I had to transcribe these tunes and then uh, create all the backing tracks for them and then teach them, uh, you know, note by note, all the lead guitar parts, all the rhythm guitar parts in standard tuning. Because obviously you can't teach someone how to play that stuff in fourth tuning. And a lot of it requires standard tuning, obviously, because there's very guitaristic things in there that you can't play in fourth tuning. That was like the most schizophrenic, crazy, hard, mental thing I've ever done. You know, one of, one of the craziest things I've ever done in my life because every fiber of my being was telling me that this note here is the note G because to me, this is a G. Yep. But of course, in standard tuning, a G is here. So every time I was saying, okay, play this A here at the fifth fret of the E string, my, it, I was fighting my brain to not have, you know, to, to not, you know, get confused about the fact that I was talking about notes that weren't in the right place. Because it's like if somebody took a piano and moved all the notes down one so that middle C was no longer middle C, that was C sharp. Imagine trying to play with all notes shifted by one, you know, it'd be a complete and utter nightmare. Yeah. Everything you know about the instrument would have changed. So th there are guys who can do both. I mean, Alex Hutchins, who you probably know, is a good example of somebody who switched at a later stage yeah. in his development and had got or, or has developed very good knowledge in both tunings and can actually switch between them pretty successfully. Although I think if you asked him, he would prefer to play in, in fourth tuning just because it makes more sense. But yeah, it's, it, it's funny actually. And it's like, I get told off for saying this. I did an interview with a, or I did a YouTube video with a, a very good friend of mine, a guy called Ant Law, who's another UK guitar player who tunes in all fourths. It's like a weird mini UK a little scene club. of guys who tune in fourths, yeah. all independently of one another. It's just bizarre. A little club of fourth, fourth tune players. And he, like, I, I sort of have always said in interviews with people and whenever I've done podcasts and whenever I've done clinics, I've always said to people, because it always comes up, people always say, would you recommend that people switch to fourth tuning? And I always say, absolutely not. <laughs> and I get told off for saying this by guys like Ant, because their argument is a very valid one, which is that it's a really amazing way to learn the fretboard. And they're absolutely right. It is. And I would advocate that if you really want to become very adept at improvising through chord changes or, sorry about my notification, improvising through chord changes or, you know, composing in a very unique way or just understanding harmony in a very in-depth way on this instrument, which is, as I mentioned before, quite a weird instrument to learn in terms of, of knowing where stuff is, being very adept at harmony on this instrument, I would recommend it. But the problem you have is if you tune in fourths, you lose a huge amount of very important guitar repertoire, like the things that make guitar guitaristic, if you like. Yep. Now, I was never too concerned about those things, but I do have this nagging sense of mild, I'll say mild, mild regret in my mind that I'm not a better blues player or a better country player because those styles require those two open strings to be a B and an E. Absolutely. You know, if you think about like um, basic kind of blues vocabulary, blues is in E or it's in A yep. on the guitar, whereas in jazz, blues is in B flat. So if okay. you think about your jazz blues, that key is, is that the jazz is like it's agnostic to, or, or this tuning makes you agnostic to being in a particular key because the key no longer is important because you don't end up with preferable fingerings for a key. But in standard tuning, E is preferable, A is preferable, yep. D is preferable because of all the open string chords that you can play. Mm -hmm. And those top two open strings give you lots of vocabulary that you can play. So if you imagine like... Now you can hear at the end there, it sounds terrible because this to me is in a different key. This is in F. And then this is back to E again. So this vocabulary doesn't work. It's just all that standard blues vocabulary is gone. You know, and all of your kind of cool country open string stuff has gone. All of your ACDC riffs have gone. So all of that is just, you know, it's like, it's incompatible with force tuning. But the, the benefits that you get are huge. If you're, if you're interested in improvisation or learning the fretboard, I would say go for it. Wow. 
So I was going to ask you that um, just about playing you know, ACDC or any of those kind of rock things if they get thrown at you. Do you Have you devised a way to be able to pull that off and sound similar to standard tuning? Some stuff you can do, absolutely. Um, some, of, But other stuff you lose completely. So there's no way around it. So if you imagine, like, if you were going to play All Right Now, so... Everybody knows that riff, right? You bar across the second fret, you play that A, and then you've got this movement, right? Yep. Everybody knows that whole thing. And if you've got like funk riffs, you've got, uh, let me let me just um, grab a guitar that's in standard, well, that's not in standard tuning here, but if I just grab this guitar, this is the easiest one to retune. So if you imagine, or, oh, sorry, it's not in tune, I apologize. That kind of a sound? Yep. That is entirely impossible to do in my tuning. You cannot do it. There is no way around it because what you end up with is. And you cannot hammer that on in that way. So you'd have to go. It's impossible. You can't make that sound good. So some stuff you can get away with and some stuff you've just lost forever. Yeah, yeah. And that's okay. You just have to accept that the trade-off is, you know, you, you, you gain the visualization, you gain the ability to play through chord changes and improvise um, with more, possibly more freedom and to learn that stuff a little bit quicker. And absolutely, I've ended up with some vocabulary, like all the legato stuff that I... That stuff has come about, that particular sound, because of the tuning. Because there are specific things that you can do through through multiple octaves that you can't do in standard tuning. So it gives you a slightly more unique sound, yeah. but you lose a lot of the things that people love about guitar, unfortunately. Uh -huh. Hey, Tom, could I get you to, to log out and log back in again and just see if that fixes your picture quality again, mate? It's just... it's. Uh, Got that jumpy thing going, and I'll, I'll entertain the masses in the meantime. <laughs> I will do the robot because I can do the robot. No, uh, I just want to give a bit of a shout out to uh, my friends at Chicken Picks, my friends at ET Guitars, and uh, my friends at Summer Cable for sponsoring a Z Show. Uh, Tom is back. Let me just see if that is any better. Oh, that looks better. Good. Yes. Oh, it's still a little jumpy, but it's better than it was. Okay. Uh, so, talking of guitars uh, and your tuning there, uh, I'm eyeing off this beautiful guitar, a Tqm one Is that not what it's called? It is called a TQM1, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, I got that wrong in our little guitar battle that's at the start that I'm going, it's a... Blah, 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 but that's what happens. Tell I me about the T said. TQM1, please, sir. So, yeah, this, this guitar is obviously my signature guitar with Ibanez, um, which still is completely mental. I don't know how that's happened. Um, but it's this is part of their AZ range, which obviously was released, when was it released? 2018, I think, uh, or 2017. I forget now because so much has happened since then. And last year has made dates a weird thing. Um, but it's essentially they're super strat um, in a more traditional format so obviously the rg was a super strat but this is the more traditional format and it's you know just an incredible guitar um, it takes that kind of um super sleek highly playable but very versatile kind of concept and runs with it basically so this guitar has a roasted maple neck and they're quite unique because the way that Ibanez approached these is obviously a lot of companies doing these roasted necks now. But Ibanez have this special technology called S-Tech where they, they don't just roast the wood, but they roast it in this particular, like, this is super geeky, but it's yeah. like, I think it's a nitrogen rich atmosphere. Yeah. I don't know why that has a particular effect, but it does. And it makes it incredibly stable. So when I, when I was on tour with Martin Miller, when we were doing the Ibanez clinic tours, we did the longest Ibanez clinic tour in history. And we went all over the place. So to give you one example, we flew from, we did a clinic in Tokyo, and then we flew that evening to Finland. So we went to Helsinki. 
and it was absolutely humid as hell in Tokyo. And then in Helsinki, it was like minus two degrees and there was no moisture in the air at all. And they never, ever, ever moved these guitars. In fact, throughout that entire tour, we had the guitar set up once in Singapore. And that's because it was so humid. You know the kind of humidity? I don't know if you get this in Australia, but... We do. Uh, you step outside and you're instantly soaked. It yep. was just ridiculous. Yeah. So you know what I'm talking about. That was the only time we ever have had the guitar set up. And it was once in like six months of, of flying all over the place. So it was kind of crazy. So that works really, really well. Um, you've got stainless steel frets, um, locking tuners at the top here. Uh, incredibly playable. If nobody, if, if people haven't played one of these before, not just the TQM1, but the AZs or AZs generally, when you think about Ibanez, you think about a skinny neck. Like yep. I've got an RG550 um, down there. Uh, I've got a gem in the, uh, in the other room as well. The necks are like super, super skinny. These are actually quite girthy. I mean, you played a couple of these, right? You, yep. you tried these out. I've played they're your one. what you'd expect yep. from an Ibanez guitar. So there, you've played my one. Exactly. You played this very guitar, in fact, I think it was, um, possibly. So they were a really, really amazing feel. It's all like oiled on the back. Um, there's no gloss or anything on here at all. So they, they play great. And then the body of this guitar is older. It's got this crazy cutaway on here for all access, kind of, you know, really, really easy. Really strong four bolts on there. And then the wood, this is really unique. It's monkey pod, which is a really unusual wood that's sort of similar to Carina in a way. And a really cool thing about these guitars is that every single guitar is completely different from a visual standpoint. So this one, like you've seen this in person, Rick, yeah. it's got this kind of stippled effect you know, where it looks like someone's actually sort of drawn on it. But there's another one. Where is the other one? I can't remember. Um, what on earth have I done? There it is. There's too many guitars in this room. So this <laughs> other one. Never. Like really crazy figuring going on. Nice. So this one, obviously, I've, I've got a diff different colored pickups in. But um, yeah, they every, every one of these guitars is completely unique from a visual standpoint. So that's, that's kind of nice. But the wood... I don't know how into tone woods I am. I don't know what difference that wood makes to the tone. You know, I just I just play the things. I like older. I like the roasted maple. You might know. I've got no idea. I mean, this guitar. I guess people say it sounds a bit like Karina, and it looks like Karina. Um, I couldn't tell you. That's all. such a, a hot. Um, but other than that, uh, humbucker single single. Five foot. Sorry, go on. I was going to say it's such a, a hotly debated thing, the whole tone wood thing. Uh, and, you know, I've spoken to many people who are very knowledgeable in guitars. And one guy will swear, nut nah, doesn't mean shit. And the other guy, other will say, mate, it, it is everything. And it's such a, a hard thing to, um, to work out. But I have heard guitars, you know, made of matchsticks and made of concrete and, and the like. And it sounded like a guitar. Yeah, this is it. I mean, I, I don't want to say definitively which way, like, I don't know. I'm not going to say I come down on one side or the other of the argument. This guitar, I know it sounds very mid rangey and it's got this lovely nasal quality that sounds great for what I do. But if you said to me, did you spec out the woods because you wanted it to sound that way? I'd be like, no, I don't know what would sound like. You know, I'm not experienced enough at that stuff. Like when, there, there were certain things I know I like about guitars. So when I was doing the jazz thing back in the day, I knew I liked large um, arch top guitars that were almost fully hollow um, because of the particular sound, the woody sound that they gave, you know, they gave me. I, I know with this, you know, with this kind of guitar, with, with the guitars I play these days, I like a compound radius if possible. Um, or if, I, if it's not a compound radius, I like a flat radius. Um, I like a particular neck shape, so I'm a, I'm a medium sort of C guy. I know I like that. I know what hardware I like, but when it comes to woods, I just I don't have a preference really. My preferences are all visual or utility based. So like the roasted maple is both visual and utility because obviously that is not going to move that neck when you're traveling around. And before COVID, I was doing quite a lot of traveling, um, and so. That is really, really important. I don't, like I experience, I remember um, years ago, I don't know if you ever saw them, but I used to play Fibonacci guitars. And those guitars are absolutely beautiful guitars. But you didn't see them. The guys were based in Hungary, uh, in Budapest, and they, they make stunning handmade guitars. 
And when you get those kind of guitars where you've got like crazy flame maple necks or bird's eye maple necks that look stunning, as soon as you travel with those guitars, like I went from Spain, within the same sort of period, I went from Spain over a three week kind of um, session. I, I was in Malaga, then upstate New York and then Las Vegas within the space of three weeks, which is hell for any guitar because it's just, you know, different humidities, but always super high temperatures. And in upstate New York, it was like, I was doing Dweezil Zappa's summer camp and it was like about 95, 100 degrees um, and, or, or in Celsius, I guess. I don't know what that is in Celsius, but it was like well over 30 degrees. And uh, it was just the, the same humidity we were talking about before where you step outside and you're soaked immediately. And the guitar I had had this beautiful flame maple neck. It was absolutely stunning, like a T-style guitar, telly style. And then I went to Las Vegas and it was about 45 degrees C and zero humidity. So it was literally like somebody blowing a hairdryer on full blast into your face the entire time. Yeah. And the guitar literally went like a banana. I couldn't play it. It was just ridiculous. So we had to take it to a tech and he had to, it needed a new nut. The nut had popped out because the woods had all kind of shifted and the nut just fell out. Wow. So you cannot travel with those kind of guitars. They look beautiful. And they play great when you play them at home, yep. but you can't travel with those kind of things. So this, for me, the utility of having roasted maple is just unparalleled. It's, it's why I think it's why it's become a fashion. You know, it's because it's it is a fashion now to have roasted maple necks on lots of guitars. Kiesel, you know, Charvel, all yep. of these manufacturers. Obviously, Sir were originally doing them back in the day, and they they still do them. There's a reason why it's become fashionable. I mean, it's it's so useful to have a neck that just never moves yeah so i've got one guitar with a, a roasted maple neck and i've found that i ding the neck very easily like it, it doesn't take much if you lean the guitar up you get something wrong and all of a sudden i've i've dinted it i'm wondering if ibanez's process with that you said uh with the whatever they got going with the special air and everything whether that hardens the wood yeah, a bit yeah. more because, yeah, that's one really disappointing thing with that, that one guitar of mine. And I love it. It's my favorite guitar. But I'm very picky about where I put it or if anyone plays it. It's just like, don't don't ding the back of the neck. Yeah, there's a, a really interesting thing with them, actually. Like, I, the, the thing I ding the most is this bit of the headstock. Because as you pick your guitar up, like you ding it into mic stands or you ding it into the ceiling if you're in a low sort of studio environment. For some reason, studios always have really low ceilings. Yeah. Um, you know, or you, you ding it into another guitar when you're sat next to other people or with other musicians or into the cymbals or whatever. Um, so I do have a lot of dings on here. And a really weird thing about these guitars, unfortunately, I don't think it's going to focus because my face is in shot. No, it's not going to do it. Um, but you get sort of a white edge to the dings, which is quite interesting. I don't okay. know why. Um, but I mean, it doesn't, like I've got no dings on the back at all. It doesn't ding really easily. Um, you know, so I, I'm not noticing anything in particular. Like I've got, what, 10 of these things here and they've all got roasted maple necks and none of them have got major dings on. But this bit in particular, I get a lot of issues with. So they end up looking a little scruffy just up here. But <laughs> I've got some of those and it's from lead singers who start off with a mic stand and the, the bastards always do this. They, they'll be singing, they pull their mic out of the stand and they, they don't look at you standing there, they just grab the mic and they put it... Psh, usually right in front of me, right where the headstock goes. And yeah, I've got dings on all my headstocks from singers, mic stands. And your, your video has just come good in the last 30 seconds, mate. It's looking good now. It was a bit bit uh, uh, Max Headroom before, but we're looking good now. So yes, and people are, are saying uh, no more pixels. Yay. That's Jason from Two Notes. Hey, Jason. <laughs> um, so Tom, when you get offered a signature guitar... What kind of things do Ibanez present you with? Is it like, a, here's all our options? What would you like? Or do they just ask you what your preference is? How does that work? They're, they're really cool with it, actually, because they're quite a high-tech company and obviously a big company. They can do 3D renders of anything that you ask for. They present you with a 3D render of that guitar from multiple different angles. So you can request, like, can I see it from, from this angle? And I see it from this angle. And the funny thing that people don't realize is, you know those um, pictures on the Ibanez website of the guitars mm -hmm. that you see? 
Those are not real guitars. They're 3D renders of guitars with obviously photo textures on. So you're seeing real tops and textures and stuff, but they're all 3D renders. So when you spec out a signature guitar, or if you do, a, say, an LA Custom Shop guitar, if, which obviously you can't just phone up the LA Custom Shop and order a guitar. Yep. But if you're lucky enough to get a Japanese Custom Shop or an LA Custom Shop guitar, if you say, I'd like uh, a flame maple top in this color, and you send them the color sample, then they just present the 3D render for you, and you can see what it looks like, which is amazing. Because whenever I've done, like I've had custom-made guitars or, or signature guitars, you know, whatever, for the past... 10 years, probably, no, less than that, about nine years now. And you spec them out and then you do this and you go, yeah. oh God, I hope, like they're gonna make a guitar that's worth five grand. I hope it looks all right. And of course it usually does because the guys who are making it, if you make a really bad decision, they'll come back to you and go, probably a bad idea. Why don't you try this instead? But you still don't know what it's gonna look like. So the first time you see the guitar is literally the first time you pick it up and play it or when they send you the photos of it finished. Whereas with Ibanez, you get to see everything beforehand. Now, I didn't get to see this. I don't know if you've seen the blue guitar down here. We can see that down there, yep. This guitar. Let me grab it. This guitar is insane. So this is a Japanese custom shop Ibanez. So this, is cra this to me, is crazy to even think about this because this is a one-off. There will never be another guitar exactly like this ever made, which is crazy you know, to think about. You get that with Sir. And you get, you know, those boutique companies that, that make custom guitars for a living. But this is amazing to me to have this custom shop, um, Ibanez. And you can see, like, this has been kitted out with this crazy flame maple neck. Now, this experience was completely different because this was much more of a traditional custom build style experience where there were no 3D renders. But they sent me pictures of seven necks. And you go, I want that one. Or they'll send you, like when we did this color, um, they sent multiple samples of different colors, I believe. I can't quite remember how that worked. And we ended up with this color. But this one, again, I, I, I didn't see what this guitar was going to look like as a finished guitar until it was done, and they sent the pictures through, um, which is quite exciting, really. But generally, yeah, when, when, when they, like the Ibanez guys came around to my house and they had a folder with, like, like you were saying, basically, these are the options that we can do. Here's all the 3D renders. What, did, what would you like, basically? So, yeah, very, very weird and cool and an experience I'll never, ever forget. Well, Maybe. you know, I, I remember when I was in high school and being very attention deficit and I would sit there and draw pictures of guitars that I would someday want to um, have as a signature model or something like that. And um, for me, it was always Strat style, but humbucker, two single coils, uh, yep. And I remember seeing your your signature model and going, "Oh, that's very close to to what I'd like." Floyd Rose is kind of I'd like to have one with and one without, purely because if I break a string, I can just put the bloody thing back on. Um, yeah, I, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I'm still looking around for that that perfect guitar. Can you show us your one again now that we're not got the the uh, pixelated? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, because before it was a bit hard to see your guitar, and it's a lovely guitar. So no we, we should. Yeah, I can't tell because to me, obviously, my image looks great. So I apologize. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if it's my connection or, or what. But as we were saying before, this this is traveling a very long way. So apologies, guys, for for not having the best audio. Uh, sorry, video quality. So how does it how does it look if I hide my face? You see? Yeah. Yep. Sure can. And rotate it a little bit more that direction that you just did. So the net. Yeah. There you go. You got the light on it now. Look at that. Beautiful. So again, like I was saying, these these tops are, are all very very unique. So th this one is this is actually is a really difficult guitar to photo photograph because you don't see unless you light it just perfectly. You don't see it. And it just looks like a brown slab. Yeah. You know, you don't get to see it. But in person, this is absolutely beautiful. And again, like with a lot of these woods, you can see there. I don't. Again, I don't know what the video quality is like but from different angles. There's a lot going on in this top that you don't see at first glance. But then the other one, if I just grab this one again, and again, for people who are wondering, yes, I've changed the pickups on this guitar just for the white. I wanted a, a white visual. But you can see on this one, again, hopefully the video quality is reasonable. Completely yep. different when you compare the two. Yep. So our video quality is perfect now, mate. The video quality is perfect now, so 
no no worries oh, good. yeah i don't know what, what that was before it might be i've never i'll have to suss it out maybe it's the time of day that i'm doing it from here and a lot of traffic or but we're good we're good now um tom you were talking about the fretboard earlier and how you um you do the fourth tuning that would throw out using anything like the cage system that most people would use i i I, I like to ask people about the different ways they navigate the fretboard. Some people are caged, some are three note per string players. Is there a specific system that you use to navigate the fretboard? <laughs> there is, yeah. I'm kind of uh, slightly dogmatic about it, like I go on about it nonstop. Um, I, I started out with three note per string, like a lot of guys, because when you come from the shred world, that's what you do. You learn three note per string. So my initial introduction to scales and, and different modes was in learning those shapes, which I, I think you were saying, you, you know, you've done that as well. Um, it's a very common thing for guitar players. So I sat for a long time doing. And, you know, mapping all of those shapes out and, you know, trying to figure out how they worked. Like you mentioned earlier, I can't remember whether it was, um, I think we were talking about force tuning and you were saying about how you've got the, the different shapes and you learn how they map together and kind of, you know, block together the fingerings, so on and so forth. So I did all of that. And then when I started jazz college, I started to try and learn my melodic minor scales and modes. And the three note per string thing just falls apart for me for that. It just doesn't map out in the same way. It's much harder to learn. This was in my first year of jazz college, I think. Um, and then I, I started getting into Wayne Krantz. And Wayne Krantz, if you don't, I don't know if you know Wayne Krantz. No. But, uh, incredible, unbelievable guitar player from New York, or who lives in New York now. Um, and he's a, what I would term a pure improviser. So he, his, his kind of percentage of, of improvisation compared to predetermined licks and kind of phrases, he's much more on the improvisation side, which is very rare. Most musicians tend to play a lot more licks and do less improvisation. He's very, very free on the fretboard. And he thinks of every single note that he plays in terms of a number. So is it, is it you know, in terms of a scale degree, essentially, is it the one, the two, the three, the four, the five, the six, the seven? Is it the flat two, the, you know, the flat three, the, the four, the flat seven, whatever? So I, I got into this and... This tuning allows you to visualize the fretboard in a really, really efficient way. What I would argue is the most efficient way. And this is where I get a little bit dogmatic about it. Like, I, I really do genuinely believe this is the most efficient way. So it takes quite a while to, to, to teach. I'm not, I'm not gonna teach it in depth or anything, um, but let's say for instance, I was playing the major scale, right? So uh, in fact, let's not even do that. Let's do the minor pentatonic scale. So if I take A minor pentatonic and I take this A here, okay, I know the note names on the fretboard, let's say. You have to know the note names on the fretboard. But knowing the note names is not the same thing as knowing the fretboard. It just means you know literally where the notes are. Okay, so if I take this A here, let's say I take the next note in that scale, which is this C here. Okay, if I play uh, the, if I number those notes, we've got one, and this will be flat three or minor third, okay? So this is common sort of knowledge, this is a minor or flat and third. If you look at the physical shape it makes from one to flat three, on the same string, my first finger is on the fifth fret and my little finger's on the eighth fret. I've got this distance of three frets, okay? So this makes a particular visual relationship between the one and the flat three. So we get this. <laughs> Okay, this is super obvious to start with, but anywhere I place my first finger on an A, this same shape will work. So one to flat three. One, 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 flat three. Okay, now I can also do one and flat three here. Uh -huh. so this is on an adjacent string but back two frets, okay? It's the same sound, but the visual relationship is different. So if I now catalog that shape, one, flat three, place my 
uh, third finger in this case on an A, same shape works. One, flat three, one, flat three. Now in my tuning, this never changes. So one, flat three, one, flat three. It's always the same. In standard tuning, you have to adjust it slightly to fit the tuning. So anytime you encounter the B string, you have to shift up a fret to, to, to compensate for the tuning. So now I've got two ways of playing the same interval, one to flat three or a minor third. Okay, so one, flat three, one, flat three, one, flat three, one, flat three. So I can play these anywhere on the fretboard now. Okay, just using that one shape. Now if you just take those two shapes, that one and flat three, that same shape, that one, one to flat three, one to flat three, occurs in the minor pentatonic, the Dorian scale, the Phrygian scale, the Locrian scale, the Aeolian scale, the melodic minor scale, the harmonic minor scale. It occurs in the diminished scale, the diminished chord. It occurs in the minor triad. It occurs in the minor seven flat five chord. All of these things share in common that intervallic structure, one to flat three. So if you catalog it like that within one octave ascending, let's say I now needed to play an F minor seven flat five chord arpeggio, let's say. I can use that same piece of information to catalog the one and the flat three. I just need to find F sharp mm -hmm. and I know where the flat three is immediately visually. I don't need to worry about what note it is. I don't need to know, I, I do know, of course, that the flat three of F sharp is A. I know that piece of information, but on the guitar, that's not very important in the heat of the moment when you're improvising. What's more important is being able to visually find it and yep. of course hear it. Yep. So when I see F sharp, I can find the flat three and look, it's the same shape that we played down here for A minor pentatonic. It's exactly the same shape. If I was gonna find a C minor chord, a C minor arpeggio, let's say, I find my C and I know that the next note I need to play is a flat three, a minor third. I can use the same piece of information again. Again here, the same piece of information. What I've done is I've catalogued what every single interval, there are 11 intervals in music, okay, going up to the octave. I've catalogued what they all look like in one octave, ascending and descending for a root note. Okay. So I know what a flat two or flat nine looks like within one octave, ascending or descending. I know what a two looks like. I know what a flat three, I know what a three, I know what a four, I know what a sharp four or a flat five. I know my five, my flat six, so on and so forth. I've cataloged all those possibilities within one octave, ascending and descending. So all I need to know is what, what intervals are in any given harmonic structure, be it a scale or a, an arpeggio. So if I know that the minor pentatonic contains the one, the flat three, the four, the five, and the flat seven, that's its formula, its harmonic makeup. Well, I know from any A, anywhere on the fretboard, if I can find the A's, I know immediately I can descend to the four. I can go to the five. I can go to the flat three ascending. I can go to the five, to the flat seven. Let's go from this A, I can go up to the five, I can go up to the flat three, up to the five, this way, up to the flat seven. Now from this A, one, flat three, five, flat seven, five, flat three. So anywhere I find myself on the fretboard, I'm not thinking, I'm just thinking about those little bits of information and our brains can manipulate in real time small bits of information much better than these giant shapes that we play. So when I'm thinking about the fretboard, when I'm improvising, if I'm playing in A minor pentatonic, if I play a line, whatever it is, I'm thinking about those intervals as I go by, as I go through. Now these days I don't have to think about it. But if, 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 if my root note switches to, let's say I go to um, B flat minor pentatonic, nothing changes except the root note. All those intervals are the same. 
We have a completely different set of notes, of course, but I've still got one to flat three. My root note is now B flat. I've still got one to four, to five, to flat seven. Here's another B flat, one to five, one to flat seven. Here's another B flat, one, flat three, five. Here's another one, flat seven, five, flat three, one, uh, one flat three. So that's basically what I'm doing. I'm just thinking about all of those individual intervals. I, I'm, I'm basically balancing 11 different intervals and choosing the ones that fit with the, with the chord or scale that I'm utilizing at the time within one octave ascending and descending. Very cool. That was a lot of information. That is. Now, if somebody wanted to uh, learn that a little bit in more in depth, do you have that available as a course online somewhere that people can learn? I do. I've got two things. So I have... On my website, which is obviously it's just my name, Tom Quayle, and then .co.uk, because obviously I'm from the UK. Um, there's, a, there's a lesson on there called Visualizing the Fretboard that goes through all of this stuff, basically. Um, and then as well as that, I have an app that I released uh, in January uh, called Solo, which basically works through this stuff. So. I don't mean to use this as an advert for my stuff. But, no, please um, do. That's, that's this, half, the, half of what I get people on for. So this app basically presents you with um, like a chord or a scale, and it asks you to play those intervallic notes. So we call them intervallic functions. So it might ask you to play the flat three, the five, the flat seven, and the one. And your job is to find them in every permutation on the guitar. So when you see it, you see... You see, maybe it'll focus if I do this. I don't know. It's coming. There it is. There Got go. it. Yep. So you see the chord. Yep. And then the microphone on the on the device will basically analyzes what you play in real time. So as you're playing, it's listening to what you're playing, and it knows if you're playing the right intervals. So it knows if you're playing the seven or the flat seven or the four or the five, and it will give you like it might say the Dorian scale, and it might say, okay, we'll play the Dorian scale starting on the flat three and play it through one octave ascending or descending depending on what you want to do and it, it listens to see if you're getting the notes right and if you don't get them right it won't move on until you get them correct um, so we've basically taught this app jazz harmony wow. so it understands two five ones it understands major and minor two five ones it understands altered chords it understands all of this harmony and we've loaded it up with a bunch of chord progressions. So, you know, lots of jazz standards. Uh, there's even like little wing and stuff in there as well. And you, you load up the chord progression and it, you, you could say, pair it with a particular level. So uh, you, you could say, okay, well, I'm gonna play autumn leaves, the jazz standard autumn leaves. And over every single chord, solo is gonna ask you, let's say, to find something simple, like the root, the third, the fifth, and the seventh of every single chord. Or it might ask you to play the scale for every single chord, or it might ask you to play like a structure like one, two, three, five, and it intelligently maps out all those intervals over the chords, and then it listens to what you're playing and analyzes whether you're playing the correct intervals or not. And it's basically a way of practicing this way of visualizing the fretboard, thinking in terms of these intervals. How do the notes that I'm playing relate back to the root notes of the chord I'm playing or scale I'm playing over? without relying on these giant shapes. So like your question originally was, do you use or have you looked at the cage system or what three note per string? My problem for myself with those systems is you end up with big shapes that occur across all six strings. And they're very, very hard to manipulate in real time. Like as chord changes are flying by, you know, if, if you're playing over autumn leaves, for example, as an as a intermediate or even advanced guitar player, who's trying to learn to play over chord changes, and you're thinking about, you know, you've got these chords. And someone is asking you to play like, uh, let's say arpeggios, for example. You've got to try and improvise with all of those notes. Like, how do you do that? It's well, if you teach somebody to play an arpeggio, like... If you then say to them, okay, well, that comes out of this caged box, or this, that comes out of this, you know, it's this giant shape across five or six strings. 
now improvise with it, what people are going to do is they're going to improvise by playing the shape basically exactly as it occurs on the instrument. So you get things like... That kind of thing where people just go up and down the shape because it's very hard to manipulate that shape in any kind of meaningful way. But if you can see like the C minor seven chord, let's say you know that that's a one, a flat three, a five, and a flat seven. Okay, you've done your music theory and you know that those are the intervals. From this C here, I can see the flat seven. I can see the one. I can see the flat three. I can see it here. I can see the five, the flat seven descending, the five. But the key thing here, the really important thing is they're isolated from a big shape. They're not part of a big shape I've learned. I know them in isolation. So I can choose them without relying on a large shape to find them. I can see them on their own. And that means I've got more control over them. It's a much more efficient way of thinking about the fretboard. So you can start to play and choose notes that outline the sound of the chords without having to rely on these giant boxes sure. for, for mapping, mapping those things out. Yeah, wow. And what was the name of that app? The, you, the app's app. called Solo. Solo. So it's, it's called Solo. It, it's basically the full title, because if you search for Solo on the app, it's on, it's on Android and iOS. You're going to struggle to find it if you do that. But if you search for solo and my name, yep. or if you search for solo fretboard visualization trainer, or just solo fretboard, you should be able to find it. And we, we released it in January and it's gone mental. I'm definitely going to have to jump on that one. I'm, I'm looking for diff, just different ideas and coming, talking to all the, these different people. I've come to realize everybody's different in how they visualize it. And I'm picking up different things, so how people do it. And that is something I'm going to spend some time on because it totally makes sense that uh, to learn that. Yeah, so yeah, it's, I'm, I'm just going to let more. the people know, Tom, that we've, I've only got you for only about another 20 minutes because you've got to go soon. So if they have any questions, please leave them in the chat room now uh, and I'll come to them soon. But I wanted to ask you about, now you mentioned that your dad was a fingerstyle guitar player. I've been lucky enough to be up close to you as you're playing and I stuck a, my iPhone right down next to your right hand as you're picking <laughs> and fuck me, man. It's like a spider what you've got going on there. Can you show me some of that crazy stuff you do with your right hand? Is there any way you can get up close to the camera and show the people yeah, yeah, at home? Sure. Absolutely. Yes, I certainly can. Um, let me just move in a little bit closer. I do... I should have set my second camera up, but I just didn't didn't have time. Unfortunately, I dropped my daughter off at school. But uh, hopefully, can you see see that? Yep. Okay? Yep. Uh, I may have to adjust the focus a little bit, but no, that's that's good. It's, we'll it's got your right hand. It did have your right hand. That's good enough. Okay, yep. cool. So the the deal for me is so there's a little bit of a backstory to the to the right hand stuff, which is that basically my picking has never been where I would like it to be. So I I can pick. Like people always tell me off for saying this, but I. I you know, that I can't pick. I can. If I take like... Oh. I do have raw, raw speed. But there's a really specific thing that's going on there. I can only do two note per string phrases, and I can only do them starting with an upstroke with those kind of things. But when I do that, I can go as fast as you like. But if you change that round and say start with a downstroke, this becomes my raw top speed. I just can't do it. Now wow. I know how to fix that problem. I know how to fix it, but I just don't have the time or the willpower to do it. Because what I've found is that just as a kind of psychological and physical thing, I prefer to play guitar with less movement in my right hand it's the efficiency thing again. So I've found that I play much better and I have much, much better time feel if I keep my right hand as, as moving as minimally as possible. And the way that I figured out how to do that is to use hybrid picking yep. on my right hand. Because when, when you pick, obviously, what, you've, what you're doing is you're, you're going with gravity with the downstroke and it's quite a large movement. Then you have to stop, change direction and come back the other way. And then you're doing this alternating motion where you are, you have this pot potential and kinetic energy transfer that's really, for me, not, I mean, if you're John Petrucci or you're Martin Miller or you're, you know, 
Steve Morse, it's the way to play. But for me, it's really inefficient and awkward. So I don't want to do that. So what, what, I've, what I've done is I've combined legato, so obviously efficiency of the left hand, executing most of the notes with my, right, with my left hand, but trying to keep the right hand as still as possible. So if you watch the right hand, even though the left hand is in focus here, unfortunately, if you watch the right hand, there's very little movement going on. It's just not, there's not that much going on. If I was to pick all of those string transitions, I'll try and do, I can't do it, but I'll try. My, my middle finger just tries to come into the equation. I can't do it. It's just, it's just too difficult for me. And my time feel starts to go all over the place. I've got yeah. notes popping out left, right, and center that shouldn't. So, so that's, that's why I do it. It's an efficiency thing. But the other reason I do it is because when you play legato, your picked notes tend to sound very different to your hammer-ons and pull-offs. Because by the, I mean, first of all, you're using a foreign object, not your hand to actually play the string. And that has a different attack. Plus, it's a heavier attack because, you know, when you go with gravity, you know, you're, you're using the muscles in a different way. And, and this thing just sounds very different to, to the sort of flesh of the left hand. So if you use the hybrid picking, I, use, I don't use my fingernail. I use the actual physical, you know, flesh of the finger, the okay. tip of the finger to actually play the string. And I just brush it very, very lightly. And what that means is as I'm playing, say, a scale, hopefully you can see the right hand a little bit. It's very hard to hear when a string transition has occurred. Because if, if I do this with the pick. You can hear that. And especially with this lapel mic, you can really hear the pick attack. Whereas if I do this. Those string transitions. are much less obvious yeah. because the by hybrid picking each new string, it sounds more like a hammer on or a pull off. So it gives you this smoother sound basically. So that's, that's why I do it. I don't use, don't use these two for, for lead guitar. I yep. do for chord playing, chord yep. playing, but not for lead guitar. Um, so it's the so middle that's, finger that's that, that comes there. into action, huh? The middle finger comes into action. Yeah. So, so you guys in Australia have obviously Brett Garced. Absolutely. He is, one of the progenitors of this style and an absolute legend beyond belief, one of my true heroes. And Brett, as I'm sure you know, uses all, you know, the three remaining fingers on the right hand. And he does a lot of roles that, that almost like if someone, like I know you had, um, I think you talked to Frank Gambale, didn't you? Yep, um, yep, and Brett. Some of the stuff you did where you were talking about, uh, and Brett, of course, yeah, about modes. And, you know, Frank is a sweet picker. So all of those notes, there's, there's a, a, a tonal consistency because all the notes are attacked with the pick. But someone like Brett, for instance, what he's doing, and it's and, to, and me to a lesser extent, because I don't play as many roles as he does, he's attacking the strings with the fingers of the right hand in order to keep the smoothness and consistency of tone. Because by using the fingers on the right hand, you get more of a consistent sound compared to the hammer-ons and pull-offs. If you listen to players like um, John Petrucci or Steve Vai or Joe Satriani do legato, you can hear, that, by the way, this is not a criticism, it's, it's fantastic. I love that sound. Um, but when you listen to them play, they've got, like, you can hear the string transitions um, and they're using legato in a more textural way. Like if you think of flying in a blue dream, that kind of a sound. Um, Whereas when someone like myself or Brett Garsett or even someone like Greg Howe or um, Alan Holdsworth is doing legato, not that I'm putting myself in the same category as those players, but I'm just saying it's a style. When, when these guys play legato, it, the idea is to have this consistency of tone and consistency of time. So you can hear subdivisions, da 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 and the tone and, 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 and timbre of the notes are very consistent. 
uh, as you as you play through the lines that you're playing. Okay. And this right hand helps a lot. Awesome. It's funny to hear you um, credit Brett as being a big influence because if I remember correctly, I think as we were talking, he may have brought you up as somebody that he may have influenced along the way. Yes, big time. So I remember we were talking about Guitar Techniques magazine at the beginning. One of the cool things about Guitar Techniques magazine was um, they always had this thing called Guitar on the Edge, which was Mark, uh, was it Mike? I always get Mike and Mark Varney mixed up. But, uh, Mike Varney um, is the Shrapnel Records guy who I should be having on very soon. Right, so it must have been Mike. So there was a column in Guitar Techniques magazine where he had guys who were on, who had released on that record label where um, like Greg Howe, Brett Gar said had done some stuff, TJ Helmerich had done a, a column and they transcribe either a solo from an album that they, they'd done. So in, in the case of um, Brett Garset, I think it was Quid Pro Quo. And TJ and Brett were playing on that album. And I th there's a song, and this is where my knowledge might be slightly off, because it might not be that album. But the song is called Loch Renoch. And it's this unbelievable legato solo. It was the first time I'd ever heard any playing like that where the legato was so defined and it was the characteristic, like the overarching characteristic of the style. Because obviously I'd played a lot of legato by that point, but in a kind of vi, I guess Joe Satriani is kind of defined a lot by legato, but still Brett Garced is a legato player by trade. It's what he does, like I am now. So I was totally blown away by this and I learned it note for note and it's still to this day one of the most beautiful solos I have ever heard in my life. And I'm not sure I could play it anymore because my style is so different now to, it's not different to his style in a, in, in a massive way, but again, those finger rolls and the particular way he approaches, again, because of standard tuning, I was playing in standard tuning back then. Um, it's honestly mind blowing. He is a huge influence on me. Um, because obviously the way I play is so similar to the way that he approaches the guitar. Yep. It's crazy, really. Yep. Yeah, he's a big influence on a lot of uh, Australian guys. He was lead guitarist in uh, the John Farnham band. And John Farnham, yeah, I don't yeah. think, was really that well known outside of Australia, but he is just one of the best singers you will ever hear. And, and this, the musos that he surrounded himself with were just all the, the top-notch guys in Australia. Um yeah, and also to be to be so good at one style and to be to be sort of known as one of the defining guys of that style, the legato thing, and then to be such an awesome slide player as well. Is oh, I love player. his slide playing, man. That's just so melodic, so melodic. Yep. Love it, love it. Yeah, he's great. Yeah, I, I got one more question for you before I, I just scan through a couple. We don't have that many questions for you there, so we should get you out of here on time, mate. But um, when I had Tim Pierce on last week. Uh, he said people are constantly asking him about when's his solo album coming out, and he says to them, man, just check out the first two minutes of every freaking video I put out on YouTube. There's my solo album. Have you got nice. Have you got any uh, recordings in the works, any albums, et cetera, or do you, think, do you view YouTube as your new way of getting music out? Well, I, I, I do view YouTube as, as that, but I, I haven't released too much music on YouTube. I mean, I... You can find various product demos that have, you know, tunes at the beginning and stuff. But for me, it's the, I was I was thinking about this earlier because I, I this question always comes up and like over the years I've always been saying, you know, I'm working on a solo album and I am working on a solo album, but not it's not an active project that's like something I'm constantly working on. I have fits and starts of it, and part of the reason is I grew up as a musician in the improvisation world, so I did the jazz thing in a big way. So my obsession with music was improvisation. And I never really was a big composer. You know, I didn't, I didn't really learn the, the production skills. I didn't really learn the programming skills. I mean, I, I know I'm very au fait with, you know, DAWs, I can, you know, Logic Studio One, Cubase, no problems at all. I'm, I'm pretty advanced at all that stuff. But where I'm not advanced is drum programming, bass programming, I have zero key skills. In fact, I'm trying to learn some key skills now. This is all I play. And so trying to get ideas down for me has always been a huge struggle. So the creative process of actually sitting down and doing stuff is always difficult because I have to sit and work so hard at that stuff. It doesn't come naturally. And these days, the production level for music 
for solo projects has gone through the absolute roof. When you look at guys like Pliny, Aaron Marshall, Tosin, you know, uh, Misha, all these guys producing this insane level of through composed uh, produced music. It's quite daunting to be honest, you know, this whole thing. I have friends who are in the same position, you know, well-known guitar players who say the same thing. So um, I would absolutely love to have a solo album out and I hope one day soon I will, but it's a, a tricky thing for me to wrap my head around finishing this project. Uh, so that's the most honest answer I can give to that. Yep. You know, awesome. It's a difficult thing. It is. It is. And um, it's funny because I get asked, I get people saying to me, oh, don't forget about your own music. And and when I heard Tim say that about, hey, check out my videos, that, that's the same thing. I'm like, uh, all the product demos, that's a new song I've written for every one of them. And yeah, that's 100% me. Well, that's the funny thing. You know, there's, there's more hours of playing of me on YouTube than you would ever get. I mean, I have to release an album every flipping week for, you know, for people to have the same amount of co- So people can listen to my playing all over the place. But there is a very, very important statement. And also, you shouldn't look at it this way, but there is a box ticking exercise to be done. It isn't a box ticking exercise. So don't read into that in a negative way. But there is a box ticking exercise. I mean, it's important to release your own music just to make an artistic statement. And so whilst, you know, I, I straddle two different generations as well. You know, I straddle the generation that grew up without YouTube and I was one of the first YouTube, you know, guitarists on YouTube, you know, putting music out on YouTube and putting my playing out on YouTube back in 2007, you know. So I straddle those two things. So you've got guys coming up now who are releasing stuff on YouTube and on Instagram and on, you know, wherever, daily producing this stuff. And they've grown up with all of this technology where they can, they can program a drum groove and have this insanely high level of production within an hour. That is not my skill set. My skill set is guitar, improvisation, you know, harmonic knowledge, and my particular style of playing. Outside of that, I have video production skills, you know, but I don't have those production skills or those writing chops that a lot of guitar, modern guitar players have. So, well, I'll tell you again, what. It's good to be honest about that. How, how about we do a little trade? Because I can program and um, I production was my world for a, for a long time and i i'd like a little bit of that flow that you've got in your legato so how about we do a bit of a trade and i'll give you some of my skills yeah, right, you give me exactly. some of yours yeah skill share yeah absolutely tom i'm just there's a couple of questions here before i let you go mate um sure. one of them from now michael dolce from the voice australia um i think you Love know michael guy. yeah yeah i do know him, yeah um he messaged me earlier and said oh Damn it! I've got a. I'm doing an online masterclass when you guys are on. I'm going to get my question in early, so he's dropped one in early at the start, and he says, "Hey Tom, thanks for being a big inspiration to all of us in Guitar Land. Have you ever had to deal with nerves or or anxiety? And when is the album coming out? I think we just answered that one. So, nerves yeah. and anxiety is that a thing for you? Uh, it used to be a big thing. Um, I okay. So this is this is a, a two pronged answer. So. If I am playing in front of a guitar audience, and this might not be what people would expect me to say, if I'm playing in front of guitarists, I never get nervous. Wow. And that is because I, first of all, that's 90% pre-COVID of what I did. You know, masterclasses, clinics. Yep. Uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of kind of teaching and playing at trade shows and stuff. That was my bread and butter because I don't gig a great deal these days because I do other things online. And... For that stuff, I never get nervous because I've got so used to doing it and I know what people want and I know how to deliver that. So it's not a problem. If I play in front of non-musicians, I'm terrified every single time. Well, not terrified, but you know, I, it's much scarier to me because you have to deliver something which is much less tangible, you know, an emotional experience or something that is, you can't just deliver the guitar goods and expect to get the same response. So it's a much more, um, it's a less rational kind of thing. It's harder to quantify that experience. And I've got much less experience doing that than, you know, playing for guitar players. So it's quite an interesting one. And I think that's not the answer that people would expect. They'd think not most enough. people would get really nervous in front of guitar players because they feel like they've got something to prove. 
but that's that's not the case for me. So yeah, possibly the opposite to what people would expect. Wow. So I, I played at a Van Halen um, memorial concert that was doing the rounds around Australia, and they had guests in every capital. I was one of the guests in Brisbane, and another friend of mine was a guest. Dan plays in a great band called The Poor, and both of us were absolutely petrified before going on, knowing we only had to do two songs each. Do your best, Van Halen, and yeah, it takes three songs to find your place on stage, get comfortable with your level yeah, yeah, and everything. Absolutely. And we were both just like, that's a room full of guitar players. Everyone's just going to be standing there with their arms folded <laughs> and looking at us. And and I found that very daunting. Whereas if I'm playing in front of non-guitar players, you can, I, I tend to play better. I'm, I'm more relaxed. So that that is very surprising to hear you say that. Uh, just a couple yeah, of... And I, sorry, go on, go on. I was going to say, I, I know you, you've, you've got to be gone in a few minutes. So um, I'm just going to jump to yeah, a couple... Sure. Two more questions that I've got there. Uh, is there a guitar player with a totally different style to you that that you would like to collaborate with? I'm thinking John Brown. I don't know who John Brown is. John Brown is an amazing guitar player. He actually just lives down the road from me. Um, yeah, that would be super interesting. Actually, a guitar player that I, I possibly will collaborate with, although this is, not, this is not a definite thing, but we've talked about it, is a, is a guy called John Gom. I don't know if you know John. No. Um, but John is one of the cutting edge, like truly cutting edge finger style percussive acoustic, acoustic guitar players who is truly pushing the boundaries. He's actually just had an Ibanez signature guitar released. Um, cool. one of the, one of the, the very first acoustic guitar signatures outside of Joe Satriani and Steve Vai. So a very important figure in the acoustic world, but we've been friends for years and years and years since like 1999. And it would be very cool to do some collaboration um, along those grounds, because we are, we could not be more different as guitar players. I got one more question for you there, uh, and that is, what's the most important pedal for jazz guitarists? The most important pedal for jazz guitarists? Yeah. Wow. Anything, anything spring to mind there? For jazz guitarists, well, these days, okay, Provided you've got a good amp, which most jazz guitarists will either have like a polytone or some kind of Fender Deluxe or something, so your core tone is really good. So many jazz guitarists these days are investigating the POG thing. You know the electroharmonics POG? Yep, yep. It seems to be, weirdly, it seems to be an essential sound for jazz guitarists these days. Wow. Like pedals generally for jazz guitarists, a lot of jazz guitarists pedal boards have got bigger over the years. but. You don't really, if, it depends what you're talking about. If you're talking about straight ahead jazz, you don't need anything, just need yeah. a bit of reverb. Yep. But for modern jazz guitarists, uh, you're sort of Gillard Hexelman, kind of uh, Jonathan Kreisberg kind of guys, I guess a pog is part of that modern sound. It's probably not what you'd expect, but mm. yeah, that's probably what I would get. I don't own one, but. There you go. There you go. Mate, before I let you go, we're just gonna we, we talked about this in the little intro that I did over on, on Facebook uh, to bring people over here, but um, the impromptu guitar battle that we had at 42 Gear Street. So that was totally, I mean, A, it was a mind-blowing display of guitar. If anybody um, puts in Tom Quayle guitar battle, you'll it'll come up in YouTube to see what I'm talking about. But I had some uh, some time coming up in Henning's main studio. I'm hanging with Dave Friedman. I'm like... Fuck, I'm 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 in there in in half an hour. What am I going to do? I'm I'm thinking I'll do something with Dave, and Dave's had a couple of drinks, and he goes, "You know what I want to see? I want to see Sammy have a guitar battle with Tom Quayle." <laughs> and I was like, "That would be absolutely rad." Do you reckon? Do you reckon we do it? And he goes, "Oh, I'll, I'll get Sammy. Here. Yeah, no worries." And yep, Sammy. Yep, no no problem. And then he said, "Yep, I go and find Tom," and he and he hit you up. And we threw you guys in there, and it was just off the cuff. You were both playing through the same amp, through a little Y box, so the sound was wasn't the best there. But um, man, like to to be in a room with two guys like like you guys, Sammy said to me afterwards, "I've never been up close to somebody who could play guitar like that before and, and see your right hand." Uh, the thing that blew me away was the sound of your left hand slapping the against the frets because you got stainless steel frets, right? And yeah, that's right, yeah. To sit next to you as your and that it's like a typewriter just going. It's an amazing thing. Uh, how did you feel getting yeah. thrown in the deep end and just like nothing prepared here, guys? But fight. 
Well, we were saying, like you say, we were talking about it before. I normally would never do something like that because the idea of a guitar battle to me, it's like, although I don't get nervous in front of guitar players, it's like, it just, you know, I, I wouldn't do it. But when De the two things there, when Dave Friedman comes up to you and says, can you do this? You don't say no. Dave's a big dude. You know, you don't say no to him. But he, I have, I, I actually thought to myself, do you know what? This could be really quite fun because I've never done anything like this before. And when he said it with, with, was with Sammy, our playing, like, we, like I was talking about with John, we could not be more different players. That's Other than right. the fact that we use drive, you know, we, we both probably have similar influences in, other, in the early days. Man, we, we're completely different players. I mean, Sammy, apart from the crazy tapping stuff he does, he's a right-handed kind of guy, yep. very kind of uh, from the kind of rock school, unbelievable player with tons of soul in his playing as well and great time feel. But yeah, I mean, it was really, really interesting to hear, like Sammy would play something and then I'd think, okay, how am I going to answer that? And then to translate what he did into your particular style and he was doing the same thing. But it was really great because I don't think we felt any competition between us at all, even though that's kind of what it was about. We didn't feel, I know this is a cliche, but there was this mutual respect and it was really good fun to sit down and see what he did and then come up with something and then see what he did again after that. It's and, great. I and really, people did really pick up on it. that, you know, like the, the comments, yep. you can see people say in there, the, the smile on each guy's face when the other guy does something, they're like, oh, that's really cool. And you were, you guys were doing a bit of a, an answer, call and response kind of thing as well. And um, and two different styles of playing. Another comment that come up a lot was um, fusion versus rock, uh, etc. Yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But uh, I thank yeah, you for, for, right. for doing thank that. For like I said, it was very right. on, off the spur of the moment. And um, I thank you so much for taking the time to have a bit of a chat to me now, mate. We've, we've hit that hour and a half, so I know you've got places to be. I should let you get going. But, folks, if you enjoyed that, please a little like and a subscribe. Um, just a reminder for the folks, it's tomquail.com.uk. .co.uk. UK, and that's where they can get a hold of your teaching materials, uh, all the latest on what you're up to. Uh, don't forget, folks, if you just want to listen to audio-only versions of these little chats, they are available on all the, the podcast sites. Drop me a review or something on there if you do that. I don't think anyone's ever bloody reviewed me because I never ask anybody to. Sometimes you have to ask, don't you? I'll drop one. I'll drop you a good review. <laughs> oh, bloody legend. Thank you very much. And at that time, I'm going to say goodbye, mate. I'm going to hit my little button right here that with my little end screen and my little magic dune and dune and dune that sounds just like this.